Good. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, to the California Homeless Education Technical Assistance Center webinar entitled Expanded <laughs> Graduation Options for Students Experiencing Homelessness in California. We're glad you joined us. I'm Christina Dukes, a HETAC consultant and technical assistance provider with Pearl Strategies. And I'm here with my colleague, Susie, who will introduce herself at this time. Hi, everyone. I'm Susie Terry. I am uh, the HETAC lead from San Diego County Office of Education and also the homeless coordinator for the county office. Okay, you've heard us say HETAC a couple of times. Maybe some of you still aren't clear on what the HETAC is, so we want to make sure you are familiar with us and our work. So the California HETAC is funded by the California Department of Education to serve as the state's Homeless Education Technical Assistance Center. It is operated jointly by the Contra Costa, Los Angeles, and San Diego County Offices of Education. As you can see from the map along the right side of the slide, uh, each county is assigned a HETAC to support you. And so uh, if you want to, you know, you may be able to just glance and see which HETAC supports your county by looking at the map along the right, but you're also welcome to learn more about the HETAC from our website at HETAC.org. Here's where we're headed for today's webinar, and I'll drop this link in the chat in just a moment. So today's webinar is based on a HETAC tip sheet that was released last year entitled Expanded Graduation Options for Students Experiencing Homelessness in California. A quick word about the tip sheet. The first few pages are informational in nature and explore California education code related to expanded graduation options for students experiencing homelessness. And then the last few pages are practical implementation tools. And so today, here's where we're headed. First, we want to make the case the importance of supporting high school graduation for students experiencing homelessness so that you know that as you're implementing these expanded graduation options for homeless students, that it's really important and it has a great potential to make a difference both for your district, but also the students that your district serves. We will review expanded high school graduation options available under California Education Code for students experiencing homelessness. That'll be Susie's part, right? And then towards the end, we're going to actually for the practical implementation tools that are included in the HETAC tip sheet that I mentioned. Of course, know that we will be looking at the chat and particularly the Q&A for your questions throughout. And so we do want this to be interactive and we'll do our best to respond to the questions that you ask. So let's first look at the importance of high school graduation for students experiencing homelessness. We've got a poll for you, a little bit of interaction. We hope you will uh, interact with us. So here's the question and I'll launch the poll in just a second. According to research by the University of Chicago, which youth subpopulation is at the highest risk for experiencing homelessness? I've launched that poll now and you should be able to vote. I see the votes coming in. We'll give maybe five more seconds for those who still would like to vote. All right, let's have a look. Okay, if you said youth without a high school diploma or GED, you're exactly right. And 53% of you said that. Uh, so yes, Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago did find that there are six youth subpopulations that are at greatest risk for homelessness, but it's youth without a high school diploma or GED that actually show the highest risk level. And I will show that on the next screen, We're going, or excuse me, the next slide, we'll actually see those six subpopulations. So you were on the right track if you responded to any of the subpopulations listed in the poll. So let me just go through. So uh, we'll leave the high school students or high school, those without a high school diploma for last, but going sort of around uh, in clockwise order, low-income youth are at, an ex are at an accelerated or higher risk for homelessness, Black or African-American youth, unmarried parenting youth, Hispanic non-white youth, and LGBT youth all have a higher risk for homelessness 
but it's youth with less than a high school diploma or GED that have a 346% higher risk of homelessness than their peers who do have a high school credential. What Chapin Hall found was what they called a bi-directional relationship between experiences of homelessness or housing instability and educational attainment, meaning the one affects the other. So homelessness affects a student's ability to advance educationally, but also educational advancement affects the student's ability to secure stable housing. And so I'll let you look at those the, the details of that graphic there, but just know that I think an important take home point here is inter, uh, excuse me, intervening, right? Whether it's in the area of housing stability or in the area of educational stability and advancement, either of those pieces can be intervened and changed and, and then change the tra trajectory of a young person's life. So let's get specific to California. According to the California School Dashboard, what percentage of students experiencing homelessness graduated high school in 2023? I'll open up that poll now for you to vote. I see your votes coming in. Thanks so much for being interactive with us. We'll take maybe 10 more seconds. All right, I'll go ahead and close out and let's see what you thought. So most of you said 57.2% of homeless students graduated high school in California in 2023, but we also had some votes for those other percentages. Let's go ahead and look at uh, the data from the California School Dashboard on the next slide. And we provided some comparison groups for you. So if you said 73.7% of students experiencing homelessness graduated, you were right, but really we wanna also draw some comparison. So starting along the left, all students in California experiencing, excuse me, all students graduated at a rate of 86.4%. Then in the middle, socioeconomically disadvantaged students had an 83.7% graduation rate. And then we see homeless students with a lower, that 73.7 graduation rate. Uh, percentage graduation rate. So we do see that students experiencing homelessness are facing risks and challenges that are leading to lower graduation rates. But also, I guess the, we, we can also see a little bit of a silver lining there, that there are still many students experiencing homelessness who have the supports they need and the resilience to be able to graduate high school. And that is a key uh, factor in their, their future stability. Any SpongeBob fans in the house? Okay, my, I grew up with my, well, my nieces grew up watching SpongeBob and I was therefore subjected to SpongeBob, but I actually kind of like SpongeBob. So SpongeBob says, let's cut to the chase. So here are your takeaway points from our first section. Students experiencing homelessness face unique challenges that make them less likely to graduate from high school than their housed peers. And yet high school graduation is key to breaking cycles of homelessness and poverty. And so what that means is that your efforts to support high school graduation will have an important return on investment both for the schools in your district or in your county and the students they serve. All right, so let's take a moment to take a deep breath and consider whether, whether we have questions or comments about what has been shared thus far. Please share your questions in the Q&A. It's a little easier to find there than in the chat. So I'll glance to see if we have any questions submitted in the Q&A. I do see a question, will we be receiving the slides? Yes, you will receive the slides via a follow-up email, and then also they will be posted to the HETAC website within about a week. Christina, it looks like a couple people are raising their hands. I, saw I, we're not gonna un, I don't think we'll unmute right now, right? We were okay. not gonna, yeah. yeah. If you have a question or a comment, if you'll just drop it in the chat or Q&A, that would be helpful. And Jody said, impressive stats and overview. Okay, I'm glad this information was helpful for you, Jody. Thank you. Again, if you have a question, 
Um, we're, we're keeping folks muted just to kind of keep moving along. We have a high number of participants, which we're so glad about, but if you would be so kind, please share your Q&A or um, your comments in the, excuse me, please share your questions in the Q&A or your comments in the chat. Okay, Gladys says, is there a difference between unaccompanied youth graduating statistics from McKinney Vento, or excuse me, then I guess in comparison to students who have a guardian or are in the physical custody of a parent or guardian? I do believe that recently at the federal level, the Department of Education has been teasing out specific graduation rates or those specific to unaccompanied youth, but I don't have those statistics at my hands right, at, at my fingertips right now. Gladys, if that is something you would like us to follow up on, you're welcome to send me an email and I can do a little bit of research and see if we can tease out graduation statistics for unaccompanied youth. Or Susie, if you know that that's readily available from California, I'll defer to you on that. I'm not aware of that being ready, readily available for California, but if I know there are a couple other people on the call who may know, Alejandro or Denise, um, feel free to jump in, but I don't think that's something that's like readily available in terms of data quest or the dashboard or anything. But maybe, okay. And then one it's... last question that um, we'll go ahead and respond to, and then I'll turn it over to you, Susie, for our next section. So Veronica says, is there a big difference in graduation rates from foster students and homeless students? So I'll speak in generalities and then invite Susie if she wants to share more detail. We do know that both students in foster care and students experiencing homelessness have lower high school graduation rates and college graduation rates than other students. I don't have the national or state specific data in my mind to be able to compare, uh, but I do know that they both have lower than average graduation rates. Susie, is there anything you would want to add? Um, I would just add that that that's true what you're saying, and I believe I don't have the the rates for other populations readily available to me right now, but I do know that the foster youth graduation rate is, I think, even slightly lower than the homeless student graduation rate. I'll add, one, I'll add one more thing. So on the slide that I showed comparing the graduation rates between all students, low income and homeless, that was pulled from the data dashboard, the California dashboard. And I believe that there was a graphic specific to foster students. And so I think that information is available. Mm -hmm. We just didn't include it in today's session. So that might be when you receive the slides, we link to the source on that slide. And so you could click on that and then look to see the graduation rate for foster students. If I can do that as Susie presents, I'll drop that information in the chat for you. And I will turn it over to you, Susie, for our next section. Thank you, Christina. Okay, I'm gonna take some time now to discuss the different graduation options available to students experiencing homelessness under the California Education Code. So um, first I wanna ask what you guys think. The California Education Code provides students experiencing homelessness who transfer schools after their second year of high school with flexible options for graduating from high school. What are some reasons, feel free to share in the chat, what are some reasons that you think this flexibility might be needed? And I see we do have some, Alejandra shared the dashboard link that Christina was referencing, and we also have someone who shared the um, foster youth graduation rate. So going back to that previous question, and then I see people sharing about moving and changing schools different requirements at different schools, not being able to complete a full semester, gaps in graduation. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, participating. Um, there are so many responses coming through the chat. I've got to back up a little bit. Moving schools, lack of credit accumulation, school mobility, too much movement. So a lot of you talk about gaps in education, movement, lost records. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go to the next slide and talk a little bit about why all of those, everything that was shared is absolutely right. Those are all reasons why flexibility is important for students experiencing homelessness. Um, so in spite of the fact that uh, federal and state statutory requirements provide for school stability with our school of origin 
options, we still see that students experiencing homelessness experience high mobility rates. And so even though there are provisions in place to sort of protect school stability, that's not always possible. That's not always what happens. So we still, like you guys all noted, have students moving around a lot um, across LEAs, across districts, um, multiple times over the course of their um, school career. Um, every time a student transfers schools, we know that they can lose up uh, from four to six months of academic progress. We know that from the research. We know that sometimes you maybe may, if you're lucky, get into all the same classes, but those classes might not be using the same textbook that you were using at your previous school. Um, maybe they're even in the same textbook, but they're two or three chapters ahead of where you were. So each time a student transfers schools, there are many barriers to their ability to be able to keep up and have success in those classes when they're transferring. And so acknowledging some of these barriers, the California legislator enacted the Ed Code 51225.1 um, to expand high school graduation options. I often refer to this as the graduation exemption. Um, I know a lot of people sometimes will refer to it by the original bill number, which was some people will say the 1806 um, option. Um, I try to stay away from referring to it by the bill number because there've been um, subsequent bills that have added to the language in the law. So for purposes of this training, I wanna make sure everyone's aware we're referring to 51225.1 in the Ed Code, um, which are the uh, expanded options. Um, so the expanded options really center around exemption from LEA graduation requirements. So um, every, just about every LEA will have requirements for graduation that they enact through their school boards that are in addition to the statewide minimum requirement. So a lot of you are probably familiar Sometimes it's a senior project or it's extra like foreign language year or any of the additional requirements um, that are enacted that are above and beyond the statewide minimum. So under California Ed Code, an LEA must exempt a student experiencing homelessness who transfers schools anytime after the completion of their second year of high school from all that additional coursework or other requirements that your LEA has adopted that are in addition to those statewide requirements. Unless the LEA finds that the student is reasonably able to complete all of their graduation requirements in time to graduate high school by the end of their fourth year. So in other words, they're on track to graduate with everybody else. They can meet all requirements by the end of their fourth year, then they, um, and the LEA finds that to be true, then they don't have to exempt them from graduation requirements. Um, the LEA also must make a determination of eligibility within 30 days of the date that a McKinney-Vento student transfers into a school within the LEA. Um, so 30 days from the date of transfer, the LEA has to have looked over the student's records and made a determination about whether or not they're eligible for this exemption. And we're going to talk more about eligibility um, requirements in a second. But first, the, the Ed Code references educational decision makers. And so I want to um, spend a second on that. So the Ed Code references the person holding the right to make educational decisions for the people. Um, in a lot of cases, like I know a lot of you work with foster students as well, it can be a little bit more complicated when we're talking about students in foster care, but for purposes of this training, talking about students experiencing homelessness, most of the time, that is going to be their parent or legal guardian, just like it is for any other student living with their parents who's not experiencing homelessness. So, um, the majority of students experiencing homelessness are still living with their parents, and so their parents are their educational decision maker. 
Um, the Ed Code also grants the following students the right to serve as their own decision maker. So a student that's over the age of 18 um, holds their own educational rights and can make their own educational decisions. Sometimes students turn 18 before they graduate. Um, and so we do see that. An unaccompanied minor who holds their own education rights and an unaccompanied youth as defined by the McKinney-Vento Act. So what I commonly refer to as an unaccompanied homeless youth, um, that is a student that meets the definition under the McKinney-Vento Act and is also not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian can make their own decision with regard to this exemption that we're talking about today. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about eligibility for the exemption. So again, I wanna know the, the first, the first bullet on the slide says to be eligible, a student must be experiencing homelessness as defined by the McKinney-Vento Act. And those are the students we're talking about today. This section 51225.1 of the Ed Code also applies to some other student populations, including foster, military, migrant, former juvenile court community school. But, but for this training today, we're focused on um, students experiencing homelessness. So I just want to note that, yes, this, this section does apply to other populations. Um, so they're experiencing homelessness and they have transferred schools after their second year of high school. And the LEA has determined that they are unable to reasonably complete all of the graduation requirements, like I mentioned earlier, those that are in addition to the statewide requirement in time to graduate by the end of their fourth year of high school. So, Let's talk about determining what year of high school they're in. This question comes up a lot because the eligibility criteria specifically states transferring schools after your second year of high school. So to determine whether a student is in their third or fourth year of high school, um, when they transferred schools, the LEA should use whichever of the following um, mechanisms that will qualify a student for the exemption. The intent of this ed code is really around dropout prevention and thinking about keeping in mind what Christina shared about risk of homelessness and the, um, the important role that education and a high school diploma plays. Um, so we're looking for ways in a sense that will qualify the student for the exemption, not necessarily have eligibility criteria um, geared towards keeping them out. So you can use the number of credits that a student has earned to the date of transfer. You can use the length of the student's school enrollment, what they were enrolled in as like freshman, sophomore, junior, when they transfer, or if they have significant gaps in their school attendance, you can use their age as compared to the average age of a student in their third or fourth year. So for example, if a student shows up and hasn't been to school or has barely been to school to earn any credits in their ninth or 10th grade year, but they are the age at which you would put them, you would enroll them as a junior based on their age. So for the, for the determination, you wanna look at what you have available to you that will help you qualify them for the exemption. Um, there's a question in the chat about a student um, have to be currently experiencing homelessness or could they qualify if they have a history? And um, I'm going to answer that question in within the next couple slides. Um, and then once I get to it, I'll point it out. And if it didn't fully answer your question, let me know, okay? But we do have an answer to that coming up. But first, let's, um, let's talk about the options they have available to them under this exemption. So a student that has been deemed eligible, um, 
there are three options available for them under this ed code. So the first is to graduate in four years, stay on track with their cohort, graduate after four years, meeting only the state graduation requirements. Um, so exempting them from all the additional LEA requirements. Um, the second option would be to take an additional year, so to graduate in five years and complete all the LEA graduation requirements. So the, the state graduation require, requirements and everything that the LEA requires for graduation. Or the third option is to take a fifth year um, in order to graduate, meeting only the state graduation requirements. So those are the three options available to students, four years at the state minimum, five years meeting all the qualifications, and five years meeting only the state minimum qualifications. So in order to make a decision about which option is best for a student, you would want to make sure that the LEA, whoever the LEA has designated um, to make these decisions, whether it's the liaison, I know in a lot of school districts, this particular um, role is designated to school counselors. Um, whoever it is from the LEA is consulting with the student and the student's educational decision maker. Um, you want to be having a conversation with the student about which of these options is going to be best. And we are definitely going to talk more about those conversations coming up. Um, but I do see, I'm going to talk a little bit about notifications, but I do see that there is, um, actually, I'm going to stop for questions right after this slide. So give me a second. I know we have a couple questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, but I just want to make a note first about there's notification responsibilities within the statute. So uh, within, I mentioned earlier that eligibility should be determined within 30 days of the date of transfer. Um, if, an, if the availability of the exemption is something a student qualifies for, it's available to them, they should be noticed of that within those 30 days. Um, so an LEA, when the student transfers in, is looking at their um, eligibility, making a determination, and then making sure that the student is notified of that within 30 days. If a LEA fails to provide timely notice, um, the student remains eligible for the exemption once they're notified, even if it's after a student is no longer experiencing homelessness, if the student otherwise qualifies for the exemption. Um, so I think that may uh, maybe answers Jamie's question in the chat about eligibility. Um, they, in order to be eligible, the student, if you, if you go back to the eligibility slide, they have to have been experiencing homelessness at the time at which they make the transfer. Um, if somehow they don't get picked up by your LEA as like being a McKinney-Vento student right away, or that they were eligible for the exemption right away, or maybe you just didn't get the notice to them right away, even if they are at that time no longer experiencing homelessness, they are still eligible. But the experience of homelessness at the time that they became eligible is part of the eligibility criteria. I hope that makes sense. Um, or I could just be making it more confusing. Um, one of my other panelist members can let me know if that's what I'm doing. Um, Okay, I'm going to look really quick at a couple of these other questions. We um, we have an immigrant. Are you going to say something, Christy? I was just going to field the questions for you. So I've answered yeah. most of the questions okay. that were submitted in q and I'm still looking at the chat. Jeannie has a question. Does an 18-year-old immigrant student who is new to the district, I think she means has transferred into a California school from a school in another country, would they qualify for the exemption? So my answer to that, and I'll, I'll let the other panelists chime in as well, is if they meet the eligibility criteria of they are experiencing homelessness as defined by McKinney-Vento, so just being an immigrant student 
doesn't necessarily qualify them. But if they meet eligibility criteria because they are experiencing homelessness um, and the transfer is after what would have been their second year of high school, um, then I would say that they qualify. Okay, so Jeannie says, yes, they're living in a motel. So so again, just to reiterate what Susie's saying, they need to meet the definition of homeless and they need to have transferred schools after their second year of high school. And I think what you're saying, Susie, is even if it's an immigrant student who transferred schools from another country into a California school after the second year of high school and they meet the definition of homeless, they would qualify for the exemption. Did I summarize that correctly? Yes. Okay. Just going back to that basic eligibility criteria. Okay. There's some questions coming in from the chat. So um, again, it, if you could please submit your questions in the Q&A so that they don't scroll up and get lost as we receive additional uh, questions or comments. There was something, sorry, let me go back to the chat if I can pull it up. Um, so I'm going to answer one that I'm seeing in the chat really quick. Um, there was another one about immigrant, an immigrant student, um, it, and that they get enrolled based on age, even if they have been in school in their original country, um, this would make them eligible. Um, okay, so I think that was just, I, I think, essentially the same thing that that we've said. So thank you for sharing that. Um, someone has asked if they have to have, I think, the meeting, even if they're not eligible and are on track to graduate. No, if a student does not meet eligibility criteria, then you don't, meaning they're not experiencing homelessness or they didn't transfer after their second year of high school, then there isn't a reason to do the notification or have the meeting with them. If a parent asks, maybe a student is experiencing homelessness and they feel like they should be eligible, um, and you had disqualified them because they didn't transfer, you can, then obviously you would have a meeting with them to explain and go over eligibility criteria and explain to them why they weren't eligible. Um, I want to share a couple of things too. So June says, so we have to give them notice, but the option for the exemption doesn't necessarily have an, ex an ex expiration date. And I think Susie is going to speak to that in a few yeah. slides about reconsideration to opt into an expanded graduation pathway over time if it's initially deemed that the student could reasonably meet the LEA requirements within, for instance, the fourth year, but it's later, maybe they don't do as well as they thought, or they have some educational disruption. There is a reconsideration process that I think Susie's going to talk about in a minute. That's um, true. That's true. Yeah. There was one other thing I saw that I was going to shoot where to go. Okay. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A that I'm going to respond and then I'm going to look in the, I'm going to look in the statute to back up what I'm saying. So for today's purposes, Susie and I are really focused on students experiencing homelessness and their eligibility for expanded graduation pathways. But as Susie mentioned, there are other student groups mentioned in the statute that may also qualify for the waiver. So I believe it's students in military family foster youth, but I wanna just, what I'm gonna do, and maybe Susie, if you wanna keep presenting, I can look that up and then yeah. put it in response. For our purposes, yes, the student needs to be considered homeless. So it's not enough solely to be an unaccompanied minor to qualify for the, for the expanded graduation options as a homeless student, but let me just look at the other student groups that also qualify and I will drop that in response because they might, the student you're referring to might be eligible under another student um, eligibility criteria. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going because I also have noticed a couple questions in the chat that I think are gonna get answered coming up. So um, let's see how we do and then let us know if we don't answer your question, but I have another just, um, opportunity for you guys to chime in and tell me what you think. Um, LEAs must consult with eligible students to help them make an informed decision as to whether to pursue a graduation option. What do you think some of the pros and cons might be for students who pursue the exempt exemption from all the requirements option? So let me know in the chat if you have some ideas about a pro or a con. 
um, not able to graduate in four years or not able to enroll in a four-year college right after graduation, that's definitely like can be one of the cons of taking the exemption. Post-secondary options um, was also mentioned. Um, that is definitely correct in that um, both of those comments that we got are part of the discussion that you want to have with students around, around their options. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the consultations now and go over what those need to look like and what needs to be considered. So once a student is deemed eligible, so we've gone through the eligibility criteria, getting noticed, we have a student that we know is eligible, they're not going to finish requirements by the end of their fourth year, the LEA must consult with the student and the educational decision maker about the available options. So again, those options being graduate in four years, meeting only state requirements, graduate in five years, meeting state and LEA requirements, or graduate in five years, meeting only state requirements. So um, which students might benefit from the different options. So option one, graduating in four years, meeting only state requirements, oftentimes is a good option for students who need to graduate in four years. They don't, um, off, a lot of times I see this um, in my county with unaccompanied homeless youth who just don't feel like they have time to spend another year in high school. They feel like they need to gain employment, they need to start working on how they're going to manage um, going forward, and they don't, they don't want the, uh, they don't want to stay for a fifth year, and so the four year with the state minimum is sometimes a really good option for them. Um, staying for a fifth year and meeting all the state, all the LEA requirements um, is good for students who may want to complete the additional requirements they just have kind of run out of time, but they're they're doing well in school, they're enjoying school, and they're looking at the possibility of attending a four-year university. Um, so it, sometimes the fifth year is a good option. They can get it all done. They can do all the work um, and have everything they need to gain admission to a four-year university. And then option three, graduate in five years, meeting on this, only the state requirements. This was actually clarified in the law. This is the most recent uh, portion of this ed code that was added because sometimes even a fifth year having to meet all LEA requirements just isn't enough time for some students, particularly I think with our students experiencing homelessness who may have missed like entire years of school and they need five years just to get the state minimum done. And again, like I mentioned earlier, and what Christina kind of showcased for us at the beginning of this, this is really about the importance of high school graduation for students, particularly students experiencing homelessness going forward. So if you need five years just to do the state requirements and it's going to earn you a diploma, then um, that's going to be the best option for a student to take and to try to get them to stay for that fifth year. Um, so the consultation that takes place, just going to go through like kind of one by one for each option. There's a little bit of overlap in these, but I just want to make sure that we're really clear um, what we need to be talking to students and educational decision makers about as we go through these options. So option one, graduating in four years with only the state requirements, you would wanna make sure that you're consulting with the student and the educational decision maker about how waived graduation requirements might affect the student's post-secondary education or vocation plan. So this has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, so just to clarify, if you're not sure what, what has been referred to, if you graduate meeting only the state requirements, you will not have all of the courses required to gain admission to a four-year university, um, particularly in California, like any of the CSUs or UCs. Um, you won't be considered meeting what is commonly referred to as all of the A through G requirements. The state minimum doesn't meet that. Um, so you would wanna consult also about other options available to the student. Do they wanna do the fifth year is, 
you know, getting into a CSU right away, important to them, part of their goal. Um, they can take a fifth year. You can talk to them about any possible credit recovery options that may be available to them and transfer opportunities available through the California Community Colleges. So if you get a high school diploma with the uh, meeting only the state requirements, it doesn't mean that post-secondary education is now like off the table for you. It just means that you may have to start at a community college and then transfer into a four-year university. So you wanna make sure that students are understanding that as well, like what the transfer opportunities are available to them. Um, there may also be at your campus dual enrollment opportunities that can help them make up credits or get a head start. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're viewing all their academic data with them and any other relevant information um, to be able to make this decision together about which is best. So that's option one. Option two is to graduate in five years and meet all of the LEA requirements. And so for this as, um, option as well, you want to make sure that you're consulting with the student and the educational decision maker about that there is an option to stay for a fifth year. A lot of students are unaware of that and that they can complete all the LEA graduation requirements. Um, letting them know that remaining in school for a fifth year um, will um affect their ability to gain admission to post-secondary institution in that they will, they have the ability to meet all of the requirements. Um, and if that is their goal and where they're headed, then the fifth year might be a good option for them. You also wanna make sure they're aware of transfer opportunities through the community colleges um, and the, uh, the student maintains their right to stay in their school of origin you know, like including the fifth year. So they also, if they're there and they're they're there because it's their school of origin and they don't live nearby, they don't lose any of their McKinney-Vento rights if they stay for a fifth year. And then option three, graduate in five years, meeting only state requirements. Again, you wanna make sure that the student is consulted with around their, that, that there is an option for a fifth year, that waiving graduation requirements and remaining in school for a fifth year will affect their ability to gain admission to a post-secondary education institution. So again, kind of same as option one, um, you can, post-secondary education is still available to you. Um, you would have to start at community college and transfer. And so, um, consulting with them about those options, any credit recovery options, anything that will get them, you know, closer to graduation. And then again, also reviewing all their academic data and other relevant information. Um, one of the things that you may want to do when you're reviewing all the academic data is making sure with the student or the parent or educational decision maker that you actually have all the academic data. Um, sometimes we find out in these consultations that there was a short amount of time at, you know, an additional school and maybe that record we hadn't gathered yet or we didn't have. So um, you also want to make sure that you're including students in like the, the review of their academic record and asking them like, are, is this accurate? Are these all the courses that you've taken? Um, so that if they're like, no, I'm sure I took world history at high school B, um, you can be tracking that down and making sure they're getting everything that they should be getting. Okay, Christina brought this up and I think this is gonna answer a couple of the questions that we had come in earlier. If a student is not eligible for the exemption from the graduation requirements, in the year in which the student transfers schools because the LEA has determined that they're on track to graduate. Like um, earlier on when I talked about the eligibility requirements, um, it is stated in the statute that if the LEA determines the student is on track to graduate, they can meet all of the requirements, then they don't have to, then they're not eligible for the exemption. So if that happens, 
then there's a requirement that um, eligibility for the exemption be reevaluated. So in the statute, it, in the statute, it says within 30 calendar days of the following academic year. So if this happens during their junior year, before their 12th grade year, um, you want to make sure you're reevaluating whether or not they're still on track. Um, you can also reevaluate at other times during the year. Um, in addition to that, and you may want to, a lot of times a school counselor becomes aware that something's happening in a student's life. All of a sudden, they're absent a lot. They're missing a lot of school. It looks like it's going to affect their ability to pass a couple classes. Um, you know, at the semester break, let's reevaluate if we, if they're on track and what we need to be doing about it. It's really about kind of staying on top of those students when we can. Um, and then providing written notice to the student and the student's educational decision maker as to whether or not the student qualifies for the exemption. So also keeping up with the notification requirement around that. Um, and then also if a student is deemed eligible, providing the required consultation about any of the different options that we just reviewed um, with the student. So a student can be deemed not eligible and then become eligible before they make their way to graduation. A lot can happen in two years of a student's life. A lot can happen in two weeks of a homeless student's life. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping an eye on those homeless students um, close to graduation that, that you maybe had originally deemed ineligible. Couple other things about that about their continued eligibility. So um, what we just discussed, if a student initially is not exempted from graduation requirements or has previously declined the exemption, maybe you found them eligible and they were like, nope, I'm not taking that. Um, the LEA shall exempt the student at any time if the student qualifies for the exemption and it is requested by the student or the student's educational decision maker. I wanna say essentially this means a student can change their mind about accessing the exemption. Um, if they originally decline it, it, the option does not go away for them. And again, I feel like it's, it's easy to think about this in terms of the importance of dropout prevention for these students that we've been talking about throughout um, this webinar. The, the second one, the middle one point, if a student at one time qualified for the exemption but was not properly notified or declined the exception, the LEA must exempt the student within 30 days of a request by the student or the student's educational decision maker, even if the student is no longer experiencing homelessness. And so again, this goes back to a question I think we received earlier, but the student should not be penalized in a manner if the school failed to provide notification or if the family had not um, been identified as homeless, and then the school realizes, oh, they were homeless. We have it now, like on our on our housing questionnaire. Um, that is not the fault of the student, and so they don't lose their eligibility to access that exemption when those things happen. Um, and then the exemption continues to apply after the student is no longer experiencing homelessness while the student is enrolled in school, if the student transfers to another school or another LEA. Um, I, had some, I had another thing I was gonna say, but I actually, I'm gonna wait till it say it on, um, on a slide coming up. So a little note about adult education students, this comes up really often as well. Um, students experiencing homelessness who are enrolled in an adult education program, regardless of the student's age, um, do have extent these expanded graduation options available to them. Um, and students enrolled in an adult education program who experienced homelessness while enrolled in high school. Um, and this, the, this area around adult ed comes up often and we have a link in the slide deck um, a little bit later on that you'll see where you can link directly to the language of the law for more 
if you need more information about any of these topics, and sometimes adult ed is one of those. Um, but I want to talk really quick about prohibited actions because um, it relates to something that I just said on an earlier slide. So under the Ed Code, there are a few things that LEAs may not do. And the first one is require or request a student to transfer schools in order to qualify them for the exemption. Um, so you can't make a transfer solely to qualify a student for the exemption. This comes up in my county, at least I get questions around this. And I think I saw a question in the chat about this. Um, sometimes a student who's not on track to graduate, um, it's, it's policy of the LEA to evaluate whether or not that student would be better served at the, at the district's alternative education school site. And sometimes it's general policy that those students would get transferred to the alt ed school anyway. Um, and sometimes the, the nature of that transfer also ends up qualifying them for the exemption. Um, what I have always advised is that the transfer to the adult ed site, if it's something that you would be doing for any student in the same situation, whether or not they're homeless, does not constitute you transferring them solely to qualify. Um, the, the important element of not transferring is if it's solely to qualify a student for the exemption, and there would be no other reason to be transferring schools at that time. So I just wanted to make a note about that. Um, you can also not require students who are eligible for the exemption to accept the exemption. Students can decline. And as I mentioned earlier, if they decline it and change their mind, they can still access it. Um, you also cannot deny students who are eligible for the exemption enrollment in or the ability to complete courses for which the student otherwise is eligible including courses needed to attend an institution of higher ed, regardless of whether or not those courses are required for statewide graduation requirements. So you can't prevent a student from taking certain courses just because they're on an exemption and they're working towards meeting statewide minimum requirements. And then lastly, you can't revoke a student's exemption once a student is deemed eligible. Um, once a student has been deemed eligible for this exemption, they have it. Um, even if they experience another school change, um, they the, the exemption cannot be revoked. So I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago. You will have um, a link to view the full text of the code for additional information um, on implementing the expanded graduation options. So there's additional information in there that we didn't cover today, just based on time around filing a complaint, LEA responsibilities to report data around graduation numbers and fifth year graduate students and definitions of terms used in the statute. And now we have a pause for, um, Questions and comments. I'm going to ask you, Christina, where we're at with questions. Yeah, so I've got one that I'll I'll respond to because I was kind of processing it as you were presenting, and then I might draw your attention to some of the questions in the Q and A that I wasn't quite sure how to answer or didn't get to. So um, we had a question about: Is there an upper age range for students to qualify for expanded graduation pathway? So I want to. There are sort of several little offshooting thoughts related to that. So let me sort of summarize the, the relevant pieces here. And then Susie, maybe you can co-sign just to make sure that I've explained it correctly. So okay. in Cal Ed Code 51225.1, there are no specific upper age limits given for eligibility for expanded graduation pathways. Zooming out though, right? There is, uh, every state has an, an upper age range where a student no longer is eligible to remain in K-12 education. That's why we wouldn't see, right, like someone my age, 49 years old, attending high school with 18-year-olds, right? So there's no upper age range that disqualifies the student for the expanded graduation pathways. 
But what it would mean is once a student reaches the upper age range in California for eligibility for K-12 education, they would then need to pursue, as Susie mentioned, is an option, they would pursue the expanded graduation pathway in an adult education environment. The one thing, and then I'll turn it over to you, Susie, to mm -hmm. co-sign and hopefully I've said that correctly. The one mention of age in Cal Ed Code 51225.1 is when a student is 18 years old or older or under 18 years old. And the application there is not about eligibility for the expanded graduation pathways, but about education decision-making rights. So I just want to clarify, once a student reaches age 18, they hold their own education rights with the exceptions and additions that Susie mentioned earlier. So an unaccompanied homeless youth who's 17, 16, 15 can also hold their own education rights. But that's really the only age-specific reference in 51225.1. Um, Susie, did you, did I say that correctly? Is there anything yes. you would add? Um, completely agree with everything you said. Um, when talking about age, age requirements, I I mean, you gave the same example that I give. As long as a student is eligible for public education, they, like, I get this question a lot just around McKinney-Vento rights. Like, can a student still be identified as McKinney-Vento once they're 18? McKinney-Vento is a federal law which covers education, K-12 education, and as long as a student is eligible for K-12 education, they're eligible under McKinney-Vento, which makes them eligible under this statute. So I don't know if that just helps, adds, but it's essentially what you said. Okay, one question that came in that I thought I knew how to answer, but then I hesitated. Uh, so Lisa says, okay, so to be clear, all three options, all three expanded graduation pathways require a student to go to a community college before transferring to a four-year university, correct? I think, okay, what we do know is if a student gets a state diploma that and does not meet additional LEA graduation requirements, they they don't meet, they will not have met the requirements for direct entry into a four-year university. They would definitely need to start in a two-year. My question, right. and then they could transfer to four-year. My question to you, Susie, is what about students who complete all LEA and state requirements in five years? Would that automatically bar them from going to a four-year or can they still go? But what, what are your thoughts on that specific no. scenario? They would not be, if you meet all LEA requirements, and I can't speak for every LEA in the state of California, but I believe that the majority of LEAs, their graduation requirements are inclusive of the require the course requirements to gain admission to a four-year university. So if you're completing, whether it's in four years or five years, all of the requirements that your school district has for graduation that should be that should not keep you from attending a four-year university I guess I will say like with an asterisk unless for some reason your school district graduation requirements aren't inclusive of all of the so that would be a discussion between you and your school counselor but almost every school district that I'm aware of the graduation requirements are inclusive of A through G or like the requirements necessary to gain admission to a CSU or a UC in California. And somebody just noted in the chat, you have to have a C or better. So there's other admission conversations that you want to be having with your school counselor around that, but the but taking the option to do all the requirements in the fifth year shouldn't automatically exclude you from the possibility of going straight into a four-year university. I hope I made that more clear and not less. <laughs> so Melissa says, I would like to request additional clarification regarding the that the exemption continues to apply after the student is no longer experiencing homelessness. So if the student changes his or her mind about the exemption and is no longer experiencing homelessness, he does qualify, right? I think the short answer is yes. If at any time the student met eligibility criteria, meaning they were experiencing homelessness and transferred high schools after their completion of the second year of high school, even if they later are no longer experiencing homelessness, they still can they still can access those pathway, those expanded pathways. Is that right, Susie? That's correct. Okay. Let me just see. I think I have an answer to this, but I'm gonna, I don't know, see what you think, Susie. So if a student can't finish 
all requirements, meaning I guess they can't meet state, even state minimum requirements in five years. What happens next? I guess they could pursue a grad, they could pursue a high school credential in an adult education environment. Would that be your answer, Susie? Yeah, my answer would be like looking at any type of credit recovery, community college dual enrollment sometimes is a good way to do that because I think one community college credit is worth three high school credits or something. So I'm not an expert on credits, but you know, obviously looking at any way possible to get them that diploma. And if they if they absolutely cannot do it which I know is is true for a lot of students experiencing homelessness, right? Like they just have missed so much school, they're not even gonna get it done in, in five years. Then pursuing an adult education program to finish that out um, would, be, would be the best option. We did get a comment that if the student is in special education, they could have more years. And that's true because true. in many states, I'm presuming in California, that's what the reference is to, is that there is usually a higher upper age limit for eligibility for K-12 public education. And so a student in special ed may have more time. Another question, Susie, what if, for example, a student wants to pursue option two, which is a, God, I gotta remember which one that is. That is the mm -hmm. high school diploma in five years meeting LEA requirements. Mm -hmm. And then later they wanna change to option one or option three or not take any exemption at all. Can they change their choice? Yes. They can change their choice of which option they're going to access because, again, we're talking about dropout prevention. So if I say I'm going to take the fifth year to do all of the requirements and I end up not on track to even get all of the requirements done in five years, we want there to be a pathway for that student to still get a diploma, which would be to still take the fifth year and meet the state minimum. Um, so again, just keeping at top of mind the intent of this is to is to find ways to get diplomas. Okay, if you're okay with this, Susie, just to kind of keep the, the momentum going, mm -hmm. how about if we move to the tour of the tip sheet and then see how much time we have left and we can take more questions then? Is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. We're going to take you on a tour of the expanded graduation option do I need implementation. To stop? I need yeah, to stop I think my I can share. Do it. I think I can do it. Let me see. Oh. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. So darn it. Grammarly is trying to correct my grammar. Don't correct my grammar, Grammarly. Not right now. Okay. Let me. Let me zoom in a little bit. So not this right is now. the tip sheet. Not right now, later, later. So this is the tip sheet. It is one of our longer tip sheets. It's a total of 11 pages, but that is because it is intended to be not only informational. So again, if you're if you're kind of struggling or just, hey, I need a repeat, I need a review after today's webinar, the first six pages are for you because it goes through all the statutory information, the details, the citations, it's all there. So when we look at the tip sheet, again, these first Six pages are informational. First, we give you context. Some of that information we provided about the importance of high school graduation at uh, the top of today's webinar. Then we talk about exemption from LEA graduation requirements under 51225.1. We talk about educational decision makers, who meets the definition of educational decision makers, who is eligible, right? So eligibility criteria for the um, expanded graduation pathways. The requirement to notify uh, the uh, to notify eligible students about their exemption or if they do not qualify. Consultations, those things that Susie talked through. So once it's once it's deemed that a student is eligible, you have to consult with them and help them in their educational decision maker. And that may be one and the same if it's if the student holds their own education rights. Um, you got to have a consultation with them so that they consider what is the best option, what options are available to me, and what is the best option for me to select. Then we talk through additional, right, so the fifth year, the LEA graduation requirements in the fifth year, the exemption from LEA gra graduation requirements in the fifth year. Again, those are those options one, two, and three that Susie walked through. We talk about reevaluating exemption eligibility, uh, the continued exemption eligibility for students over time. 
uh, and then students pursuing an expanded graduation pathway in an adult education environment. Then some of those prohibited actions that Susie went through, and then additional statutory provisions. So if you need to, to bone up on any of the details, those are the um, informational pieces there for you by header. Then we get into some of the, um, the implementation tools. Now, the reason that this particular tip sheet is provided to you in Microsoft Word format is so that you can, some of these are things you want to fill out and use as forms. So you can use them, you can customize them for your district, but we wanted you to have some practical implementation tools. This first tool, this first page, are guiding questions for LEAs to consider as they're implementing expanded graduation pathways. So considerations for identifying eligible students. For analyzing credits and reasonability, meaning is it reasonable for a student to meet all LEA uh, graduation requirements in four years, only state graduation requirements in four years, all LEA requirements in five years, or only state requirements in five years. Then um, documenting notification, consultation, and selection of expanded graduation pathways, and then revisiting graduation uh, option eligibility and choice or selection. So these are just things for your LEA to consider as you're implementing 5122.5.1. Then there are student level strategies. So when you're working with an individual student, what steps to take to consider whether they would be eligible for expanded graduation pathways, and if so, which one, and how to consult with them about that and notify them. So firstly, gather student transcripts and analyze their credits. That's going to help you know. Uh, did they transfer schools after the completion of their, sorry, actually that's step two, but look at their credits to see if they might be considered eligible for um, the expanded graduation pathways and then determine if the student has completed the second year of high school. That's all going back to, are they eligible? Then it's conduct a credit analysis to help understand, okay, could they complete an LEA diploma reasonably in four years? If they can, then you don't offer the exemption, right? Um, if they cannot, that's when you look at the other options that may be available to them. Then it's, okay, now we need to notify the students and have a consultation so that they can select the pathway that is best for them. And last but not least, once the pathway has been selected, you want to support the student in making sure that they have enrolled in the proper courses to meet the graduation requirements for the pathway selected. Then if you need a worksheet, right, to, to crunch numbers, to crunch credits, to see where the student falls in terms of meeting LEA requirements or state requirements, you can do that here on this worksheet for the individual student. Then we have a notification of eligibility. This, I believe, is for, um, is, is for the LEA's own record keeping, right? So you can you have a record of the fact that you did your due diligence, you analyzed the students, you considered the students' eligibility, and you have a documentation of that consideration and the determination that you made and why you made the determination. Then we also have a parent or student-facing notification, right? You're required to notify the student and their educational decision maker. Uh, and so that is what this um, tool is for, is for making sure that both the LEA and the student and the educational decision maker are on the same page and that it is documented about which pathway will be pursued. Okay, and I think that's it. These are things you're probably going to want to Look at on your own, sort of digest, but just know that there are tools here for you that are provided in Word format so that you can customize them to your LEA. With that, I think I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and then, Susie, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we're at our final Q&A. So um, what questions do you have either about the tool that we just shared or really anything that has been shared thus far. I think if you move forward one more, there we go. So we've got a solid 15 plus minutes <laughs> to handle questions. Let's see. 
and let us know if somehow like we missed your question or no one answered it. Um, we have time to go back. I, oops, um, I meant, so Melissa says, I'm sorry, where is the form for our records? It's on the HETAC website. And I believe Denise just dropped the link into the chat. If you wanna go ahead and click that link again, note, it will download as a Word document to your downloads folder. So you know how a lot of times when you download a PDF, it'll appear in your web browser. In this case, because it is a Word document, it will download to your downloads folder. So look for it there. And I do believe the slides get mailed to everyone. And if I'm correct, this is this this is also linked in the slides. So you will definitely get access to it. Okay. So Ida says, what about homeless immigrant who has no transcript and we can't get one. This is something that sort of um, touches on various areas of practice. I can take a shot here, Susie, and then maybe you Please can do. add. <laughs> so firstly, we do have a prompt and proper placement brief that talks about what do you do for a student that you don't have full education records for, but you need to decide school placement. So I do wanna say that there are some tools that we have, like requesting documents through the embassy or, and, and if all else fails and you simply cannot get official documentation, then you need to take some of the steps in the prompt and proper placement brief to analyze where you might place the student, right? That can be through discussing with the student and the student's parents to try to get an idea like what courses, and we, and we include all these questions and strategy recommendations. Uh, Susie dropped the placement tip sheet link in the chat. Talk with them to try to get an idea of what courses the student may have been taking and be willing to accept records or information directly from the student or the parent but then you also have the option if all else fails to conduct a, and likely someone in your school district already has this type of a tool that can be used. You essentially conduct an, an, a real time um, evaluation, or I don't know if that's the right word, assessment of the student's ability to inform placement. So first you need to determine placement, and then you need to ask yourself, um, Okay, does this student, so, so that's the first thing. Let's not even get into expanded graduation pathways. You're just trying to make, to get the best idea possible of where the student would be or should be placed in school. If after those steps have been taken, you realize, you know, then you consider, would this student be eligible for expanded graduation pathways? Meaning, have they changed school? Did we just enroll them? It sounds like you're saying they've just come to us from another school and we are now enrolling them, they could qualify as a newcomer student. That is another group of students who are eligible under 51225. But if they are a homeless student and you determined that they transferred into your school after completion of their second year of high school, they would be eligible. You don't necessarily have to have a transcript um, to determine that placement. Susie, did I do okay there? Or yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, same. I don't think I have anything to add. I did add the link to the place prompt and proper placement, which is a HETAC tip sheet. And there are a number of links on that tip sheet to places you can go to try to get help in tracking down transcripts. It takes time and effort and capacity. But yeah, aside from that, I wouldn't add anything to your answer. Um, uh, Susie, do you oh, happen to so a question from Amy? You referenced that California has an upper age for high school students for eligibility for K-12 education. What is that age? Do you happen to know that, Susie? Um, I do not. I know that if you have an IEP, you have until 22 to finish high school. Um, I'm looking online to see if I can find it or if anyone on the webinar knows that. I don't know that. if Denise or Alejandro might know the answer to that. No, I'm more familiar with special ed and the keeping mm -hmm. up until 22. And then, but if they're 18, you'd want to, I mean, we usually consider adult ed at that point, depending on what time of year they're coming in. But again, it's, I don't have the exact uh, reference. 
And somebody in the chat just said, I believe you could be 19 in high school, but not 20. And that sounds very familiar to me. I think in, um, in our largest district at 19, there is an adult ed option that you kind of can transfer into. Oh, Heidi, thank you, Heidi, for chiming in from CDE. Um, she believes this is a local policy, um, which can very, would very well be true. Um, Let me see. I am looking on the Education Commission of the States to see what I can see about thank California. Thank you um, Tina, for also adding English learners. Um, while you're doing that, the, there was a question about how an unaccompanied minor would go about getting their own ed rights. I'm assuming this is related to an unaccompanied minor who's not considered homeless. Um, the only, there are a couple things I think about that, and I'm definitely not an expert if a student is not homeless, but the first thing I would say is to take a close look at their living situation and see how stable it is and see, um, you know, if maybe there is area under the McKinney-Vento definition where they fit. Um, if not, which is happens, there are unaccompanied minors who are not considered homeless. You can consider um, the person with whom they're staying being on a caregiver affidavit, and that would help them um, have somebody close to them with access um, to their education rights. Otherwise, I think the only option would be for a student to try to become emancipated in order to hold their own ed rights, but I definitely welcome anybody else who maybe has answers to that question. Um, to I want to. I'm going to circle back, Susie. I just dropped a link from the Education Commission of the States in California. This is how they word it, but I'm going to kind of translate it into how we've been talking today. So, age requirements for a free education in California: you can be between uh, five years old and 21, and then age requirement for compulsory education is six through 18. So, you must be in school at ages six through 18, but you may be in school for ages five to 21. And again, noting that I think you might be able to be a little bit older for special education. So that's, I dropped that link in the chat. Thank you. Stacy asked a question that their problem is more frequent on the lower end in that they have students who are not yet 18 have completed a fourth year and cannot transition to adult education yet, but due to the number of credits needed, aren't a good candidate for a fifth year. So I would say this, if you have a student who's completed their fourth year, I'm assuming they are, this is a McKinney-Vento student, so we're talking about the exemption. If they're a McKinney-Vento student, they've finished their fourth year, they haven't met any graduation requirements, state minimum or otherwise, they can't go to adult ed yet because they're not 18 and they're not a good candidate for a fifth year. My suggestion, um, this is just my personal opinion, is to enroll them in the fifth year under the exception to do the state minimum, even if you think they're going to need more than a fifth year to complete it, because by the end of their fifth year, they will be eligible for adult ed. Um, that's my thought. I don't know, Christina, if you have anything that you would add to that or anybody else on the panel. Um, but again, trying to keep trying to keep a student from dropping out, like thinking that there's no hope. <laughs> the the only thing, yeah, I, I I partially was like multitasking and looking at the other questions and just so my brain was in multiple places. The, the the tension that I think you're talking about, Susie, is what, what we would not want to see and would, would not be, I think, in the best interest of a student is jumping quickly to a, they can't do it, they got to go to adult ed, right? Because that can be demotivating or lead to sort of disengagement, and that's not a good thing. Having said that, there may be times where you think it through, you're talking with the student and their educational decision maker, and it simply would not be possible. And so to, to complete in a traditional high school environment, in which case maybe considering 
some kind of adult education or more alternative type of education could make sense, but we just don't, we just want to encourage folks not to jump quickly to that. That should be after full consideration of all options. Would you agree, Susie? Yes, 100%. Um, so the question about an unaccompanied minor obtaining their own ed rights was clarified that the um, person asking the question was speaking about a homeless unaccompanied minor. In that case, there isn't action that necessarily needs to be taken. The law, the McKinney-Vento statute and portions of the Ed Code give that unaccompanied homeless youth the ability to make um, certain decisions about their education without having to take any action to sort of obtain their own ed rights. Would you add anything to that, Christina? Ah, sorry. I'm like reading through. I didn't hear what you said. I apologize. I'm reading through the Q&A. I'll try to listen better next time and stop doing so. Q &A. Let me just summarize for you really quick. An unaccompanied homeless minor does not have to take any specific action to be afforded their ed rights. No, you're right. So specifically okay. in 51225.1, it names unaccompanied homeless youth whether they've reached age of majority or not, that they can hold their own education rights. The only thing that I said, and you might have just said this, Susie, that I said previously is if it's a 12 year old, right, who meets the definition of unaccompanied youth. So, well, I guess they wouldn't be in high school at that point, right? So, sorry, I'm just kind of thinking out loud. In most yeah. cases, right, high school age students are going to be, you know, upper teens, right? And so they're, they're probably able to consider with good solid consultation and advice what is in their best interest. Having said that, it doesn't hurt to have caring, supportive adult or a caregiver if there's a caregiver involved in the student's life or school guidance to help them be informed and equipped to make a decision in their own best interest. But they, if, if they meet the eligibility criteria for the exemption and they're an unaccompanied homeless youth, they do hold their own ed rights. And um, I just want to add that um, McKinney Vento gives them the right to, around school selection. Like there are a couple places in the law where the law directly gives, like this particular section of the Ed Code gives them the right to make this decision about their exemption. Uh, McKinney Vento gives unaccompanied homeless youth the right to enroll themselves, specifically, specifically the school selection. Right. So there isn't a specific um, action that has to be taken on the part of the youth. Um, there was a question that I think um, is a follow up in the chat that says, what if the unaccompanied homeless minor is a special education student? Um, I what I if you're asking about the exemption, I don't there aren't any differences around eligibility or notice or implementation of the graduation exemption for a special ed student, except that they do have longer um, that they're eligible to meet graduation. If you're talking about ed rights and an unaccompanied homeless minor and special education, that's actually kind of a whole other training that we do. And I would definitely invite you, if those are your questions, feel free to reach out to me. There are There are answers to like who can sign an IEP and all of that for an unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, that again, like are actually part of a separate training. So I don't want to take too much time on that, but you can also access that training. The, the unaccompanied homeless youth training is archived on the HETAC webinar and you can watch it and, and look at the slides. I think it's addressed in the slides to that training. So if that, if your question is just about unaccompanied homeless youth, I would, I'm going to kind of table that for this particular webinar if that makes sense if you don't mind Susie let me just say let me just share my thoughts on that and then I'm looking at the time and and Denise asked us in the chat hey let us know when we're ready to move to share the evaluation which I think we probably should head that direction so we can yeah. get get people out on time there's nothing in ed code 51225.1 that says an unaccompanied homeless youth can't hold their own education rights if they're in special education so, what, so there's nothing in Ed Code 51225.1 that says that. But as you know, under IDEA, there are requirements about um, a student about about who can serve as a student's educational decision maker, right? And so that's where we get into this 
this territory of the complex interplay between different statutes. I think, right, so once a student reaches age of majority, if they have the capacity to serve as their own educational decision maker, they can, but if not, and there's no one available who meets the definition of parent, and the IDEA definition of parent is broader than just a biological or even an adoptive parent, um, then a surrogate or temporary surrogate parent can come into play. So there's some interplay there. If you wanna talk through a specific scenario, we could, do that maybe offline, but you're getting the complex interplay of different statutes and also just considering what makes the most sense and is the best for the student. So I'll, I'll throw that out. I think it's probably a good time to go ahead and, and move to close out. So we wanna thank you for joining us. Uh, we had a rousing session. We had good attendance with lots of questions. Thank you so much. You can follow up with us at our email addresses there. And then I'll turn it over to Denise to share about the webinar evaluation. I went ahead and just posted um, the link in the chat, and it also links you on the QR code that's on your screen. Um, also, all of our archived webinars and tip sheets that were referenced here, the unaccompanied youth and special ed are also on the HETAC website. And so we'll go ahead and post that again. Um, but those, those along with this webinar recording will also be posted once ready on that same website. Thank you, Denise. Um... I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back. We had a request to like switch back to the contact info. And I also know there was a um there was a comment that a question was not fully answered. Um if you want to ask Eva, um ask us your question, we'll we uh, I'm happy to make myself available for that in a couple minutes after we close out. Um and then again, I posted the tip sheet on special education that the HETAC also did that does speak to um, unaccompanied homeless youth. And I also just want to encourage you to check out the archived webinar on unaccompanied homeless youth um, if those are your questions. But for today, I hope we answered your questions on the graduation exemption. I think with that, um... We are right at about uh, time. So we just, I'll drop in the chat once more, the link to the evaluation. Please do share your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day.